All right, everyone. Um, we're going to get started. We've got the live stream going, um, and I'm aware that many of my colleagues are <laughs> in their offices watching this, which is lovely. Um, colleagues both near and far. Um, to begin with, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Liska Chan. I'm an associate professor in landscape architecture in the College of Design. Um, and I'm also on the faculty in the Clark Honors College, which is partly why we decided to come on over here. Um, so welcome, everyone. It's really lovely to see everybody here. Um, I'm going to give you a little background on today's talk. Um, and tell you a little bit about um, Sarah, and then we will go from there. Um, so to begin with, I just want to tell you a little about um, the Oregon Places Prize. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Places Journal. Um, if you're not, look it up. Um, so in the summer of 2019, in partnership with Places Journal, the College of Design announced a request for proposals um, for a new Biennial Oregon Places Prize with the theme of power and place. Um, the prize has been established to support ambitious public scholarship or publicly engaged research, teaching, and programming on the practices, institutions, spaces, and aesthetics that encourage or obstruct urban equity and environmental justice, as well as the relationship of the disciplines to larger structures of power. We chose the theme because the most press, pressing issues today are linked to power. This is made especially apparent when we link power and place. One can see it in cities, for example, where deep disparities in socioeconomic power result in environmental degradation, unmitigated strains, and unmitigated strains on natural resources. So we had a lot of applications. Um, um, it was a very successful request for proposals, um, and they were very strong. Um, yet Sarah Jensen Carr's proposal stood out um, to the whole committee, which was actually made up of faculty fr from the College of Design as well as um, uh, folks from Places Journal. Um, so before we begin, I first want to, and before I introduce Sarah, I want to express my gratitude, our gratitude, um, to Nancy Levinson, the editor and executive director of Places Journal, and her marvelous team for initiating the Oregon Places Prize idea. I'm also very grateful to the College of Design, which has been the dedicated supporter and sponsor of the prize. Um, also, I'd like to extend a special thanks to Dean Adrian Parr and her amazing team, especially to Shelley Abusukila and Kate Conley, plus to Angie Hume, Managing Editor at Places Journal, and Francis Richard, uh, also Senior Editor at Places Journal. Um, incidentally, this is um, not only a lecture tonight, but of course, um, it's coming out in Places Journal tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. There will be a big launch, um, and um, which we are very excited about. Um, Sarah's been working very hard on this for a couple of years now. We had hoped to do this a year ago, <laughs> but we all remember what was happening a year ago. So first, uh, well, lastly, I should say, a little about our speaker. Sarah Jensen Carr is an assistant professor of architecture and the program director for the Master of Design and Sustainable Urban Environments at Northeastern University. Her work and research on the connections between urban landscape, human health, and social equity has been recognized by the Graham Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, and the National Science Foundation. Is that starting to get lower, the light? I don't know why, <laughs> but we'll, we'll see. Um, and it's actually very exciting. She's been published in Pre um, Preventative Magazine, LA Plus, the Avery Review, Hawaii Journal of Medicine and Public Health, among others. And very, very exciting. Her first book just came out, um, The Topography of Wellness, How Health and Disease Shape the American Landscape. 
which was just recently published by University of Virginia Press. So please join me in extending a warm welcome to Sarah Jensen Carr. And I am not sure how to brighten you up here. Um, No. Do our marvelous tech people have any ideas? Is there a remote control for the projector? Is it this? Uh, that is for the. talk in a long time, so I know we're all ironing out the kinks. Um, it's enormously gratifying and a little bit terrifying to be in here with all of you, but um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, of course, uh, just as Liska acknowledged, thank you first and foremost to the University of Oregon College of Design and Places Journal for sponsoring this generous award, in particular Liska, um, and Nancy Levinson and Francis Richard at Places for their guidance and mentorship throughout the writing of this article. Mahalo nui loa to activists, cultural practitioners, government officials, and scholars who have been speaking to me over the course of this past year and really helped inform this piece, uh, especially Sean Connolly, Sydney Lynch, Matthew Gonzer, Kay Lanboom, Laura Ruby, Dr. Diane Paloma, and Dr. Jane Chungjo, all took the time to share their first person insights with me. Uh, and Dr. Candice Fujikani uh, very generously agreed to read a draft of this article for cultural and linguistic accuracy and provided detailed and thoughtful comments on its structure. Um, but most of all, maybe um, in, in lieu of a traditional uh, land acknowledgement, I also wanted to say mahalo to the Native Hawaiian scholars, practitioners, and activists whose work I'm very privileged to share here tonight in order to convey the extremely urgent political, climatic, and social conditions under which they are working to reclaim their landscape. And by extension, the political, ecological, and social power that has been taken from them. And I thank them for their knowledge and stewardship. The name Waikiki means spouting waters, a nod to the flowing waterways and rich farmland of taro, rice, and fish ponds that in pre-colonial times characterized this landscape on the island of Oahu. Today, Waikiki remains perhaps the best known public place in Hawaii yet its image in the popular imagination betrays none of its history. Instead, most Americans' perceptions of the Hawaiian kingdom remains essentially static, stalled in the year of Hawaiian statehood, 1959, even as Waikiki Beach has continued to be shaped by hyperglobal commerce. Waikiki stretches for less than a mile and a half on the southeastern shore of the archipelago's most populous island.
science scholars, writers, storytellers, and activists have made clear over the past century. This thin strip of beachfront, much like, um, like much of colonized Hawaii, was always a mirage. The merchants and military interests who advocated for draining the marsh and building the canal 100 years ago did so on the pretext of protecting the public from miasmas and mosquitoes, although a more pressing interest was the exploitation of oceanfront real estate. The expansion of Waikiki and the building of the Alawai Canal accelerated development and catalyzed colonization on Hawaiian lands. And now this infrastructure has locked the state's residents in a stalemate between profit and sustainability. The struggle over the future of the Alawai Canal is, on the surface, an issue in urban water management. But it is also a microcosm for much larger questions about power, social justice, and the material legacies of colonization. Given the urgencies of our era, what happens in Waikiki in the coming years might serve as a model for other cities seeking infrastructural, social, and economic sustainability. Histories of 19th and 20th century urbanization tend to be predicated on capital and its efficiencies, favoring those whose financial and industrial resources allow them to literally reshape ground conditions to their advantage. From the point of view of industrialists and policymakers, the variability of landscape ecology and the long-term stewardship necessary to a thriving biosphere can seem inefficient or simply inconvenient. Narratives of the American urban landscape too often emphasize the prowess of modern engineering, asking less frequently who holds the power to manipulate infrastructural capacities, separating technical achievement from its societal reverberations. Two decades into the 21st century, it's not uncommon to hear that such long-held perceptions and practices are destabilizing under pressure from accelerating climate change, persistent issues of social and racial justice, and widening economic inequities. The city's remoteness and small size, as well as the particular violence of its colonial history, only intensify issues that many other cities will also have to confront in the near future. As these climate disruptions intensify and these calculations in concrete and infill become less and less effective, a growing number of activists, scholars, and community leaders are advocating for a recentering of traditional water ecologies in Honolulu's built environment. This is nothing less than a vision of an emergent watershed urbanism, a paradigm that, if integrated into planning policy, could move towards a reconciliation of landscape ecologies, indigenous science, and economic justice, in order to assure that even a city like Honolulu can support all its inhabitants over the long term. In Honolulu, as elsewhere, to reshape our cities around the cases, uh, the care of streams, rivers, lakes, oceans, and the lands they water would mean a core rebalancing of power from distal federal and commercial entities to local ones. A watershed urbanism, uh, in this sense, would um, require a shift from an economy based in revenue extraction to one based in the maintenance of food systems and other natural resources. The future of Oahu could exemplify a watershed urbanism that reroutes design and planning in indigenous knowledge and de-engineers more than a century of settler colonial colonialism. When I first visited Honolulu prior to moving there for four years to teach at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, I found it reminiscent of my birthplace of the Manila Philippines, where my mother's family still lives and where we visited almost yearly until I entered high school when we moved closer to my father's family in South Dakota. Like Honolulu, Manila's urban landscape is distinguished by its juxtaposition of American and Asian influences, its high-rise towers and low-slung open-air apartments and schools, its resignation in regard to terrible traffic, and its channelized and polluted waterways that make themselves suddenly and violently known in rainstorms. It wasn't until years later that I learned to read these characteristics of the built environment as marks of occupation. I am the granddaughter of an indigenous Filipino who was forced to push wheelbarrows for miles to deliver rice to Japanese soldiers occupying the Philippines during World War II, who bears a Spanish name given to my ancestors by unknown invaders. I am the great granddaughter of a Danish immigrant who settled on land stolen from the Lakota nation by the US government. It was not until I moved to Hawaii, geographically halfway in between these two colonized landscapes, that I found myself surrounded by others who understood the contradictions and ambiguities inherent in such a lineage. Although, of course, in Hawaii, I was also a settler myself. Colonialist uh, engineering projects like the Alawai Canal often view all water, rain, streams, oceans, as a uniform substance to be manipulated without regard to the hydrological complexity that indigenous science has long managed in order to keep the ecosystems in balance. In Hanokaua, 
Hawaiian rain names, uh, written in 2015, Hawaiian language specialists Colette Lemomi Akana and Keely Gonzalez collected more than 200 names for precipitation in the lexicon, each denoting a rain with specific duration, intensity, color, sound, and scent. At the same time, in Hawaiian, as in any language, a single word can connotate many things depending on context. Why means water, repeated, why why, it means value or wealth. Prior to colonial contact, the native Hawaiians, or Kanaka Maoli, organized governance, settlement, and trade in synergy with hyperlocal landscape ecologies in a comprehensive system known as Ahapua, um, which, was, uh, which was consolidated into larger divisions called Moku. It is estimated that Hawaiians began to develop the system circa 1200. In physical terms, Ahapua are land divisions, typically running from mountaintops to the outer edges of offshore reefs, or Malka to Makai, and encompassing along the way rivers, forests, and farmlands. The system assured sustainability through binding societal agreements and sophisticated hierarchies of oversight, as well as the careful reading of climate, topography, and water flows. The overarching goal of these socio-ecological structures was to create shared abundance rather than to amass individual wealth. Several centuries of militarism, tourism, agribusiness, and global capitalism violently undermined that heritage with reverberations for the health of the archipelago and all its residents, especially native Hawaiians. At its most basic, Anahapua can be thought of in three sections, upland forests, mid-slope croplands, and aquacultural shorelines, although Kanaka scholars note that within these divisions there might be more than 20 microclimates and distinct realms of stewardship. A small but significant number of Ahapua were entirely inland or entirely coastal, leading historians to believe that these were defined by particularly strong ties to intertribal trade. A geospatial analysis conducted by the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 2017 showed that even today, solar radiation, rainfall, and mean average temperature are consistent within these historical moku boundaries, verifying that these reflected a sophisticated understanding of microclimates and agricultural yield. The rights of individual families were codified in the kapu, the tribal codes that determine timing and procedures for resource distribution and harvest, as well as restrictions and punitive measures applicable uh, across a given moku. Productive use of water and high crop yields would be rewarded with expanded water access for given families, while mismanagement would result in the revocation of usage rights or sometimes even death. The Mauka, or forested upland, was the most sacred zone of an Ahapua. The Waokua, or apex, was believed to be cultivated by the elements rather than human hands. Other zones were strictly managed to contribute to overall biodiversity. Some forested areas were maintained specifically as bird habitats or for watershed recharge. Others were used as woodlots or as gathering ranges for foodstuffs, medicines, and crops like sandalwood and kukui, the candlenut tree, whose nut could be used for medicine, moisturizer, or fuel oil. Dr. Diane Paloma, a cultural practitioner and expert in native Hawaiian health, told me, there are specific names for kinds of mists in Hawaiian. Mist that comes from the ground, mist that comes from the atmosphere. The very fact that Hawaiians knew about these elements defines how they categorize things in the world. Contemporary hy hydrological studies of Hawaiian forests <laughs> confirmed at other sites around the world have shown that precipitation, frog, fog, and even cloud-derived uh, aerosols at higher elevations each have different isotopic compositions of hydrogen and oxygen, and that the balance of their respective inputs is crucial to forest health. As Paloma pointed out, indigenous science understood such ecosystemic interactions and managed the lands and waters accordingly. Moving down the Ahapua from the Mauka to the Kula, or plains, one encountered fields called Lo'i for the intensive cultivation of taro, or kalo. Taro roots must be constantly submerged in cool water, which must be kept moving to prevent rot. Lo'i were therefore intricately terraced with earthen berms and rock walls, directing nutrient-rich downflows into ditches and streams. Taro is fundamental as well to Hawaiian cosmology. Land was born of Wakea, the sky father, and Papahanaumuku, or Papa, the earth mother. When their daughter Ho'oho Kukalani gave birth to a stillborn infant, the gods planted the body, which became the first taro plant, or Haloa Nakalau Kapalili. The goddess's second child was the first Hawaiian person, named Haloa after his older brother. As the elder sibling, taro provides sustenance for the Kanaka Maoli, 
while they, as younger siblings, care for the plant. The lowest portion of an ahapua is the kahakai, where shore meets ocean, and here fish ponds, or loko ia, were kept. Different types of ponds, constructed with various kinds of walls and gates and fed by fr uh, fresh or seawater, serve different needs. Wooden sluice gates, or makaha, makaha, let fish into the ponds while filtering flows and controlling drainage. The fish would re feed on rich runoff from the lo'i and grow too big to swim through the gates again. Stocks in some ponds were plentiful enough to be caught with bare hands. If ownership ever held sway in, uh, uh, in Ahab, Ahapua, it was here, in that larger loko ia, where associated with royalty or chiefs. It is estimated that 449 fish ponds were built prior to 1830, when the last new construction was documented. Like other ahapua on the island, the Waikiki ahapua was fractured in the 1848 mahele. This division was decreed by King Kamehameha III under duress from white settlers and was intended to apportion uh, Hawaiian lands in thirds among the crown, chiefs and managers, and commoners, but instead resulted in the sale of many of these lands to settlers and corporations. The decree is still viewed by many native Hawaiians as a tragedy. By the time it was completed, just 1% of the archipelago's 4 million acres belonged to its original citizens. Many families who had farmed for generations under the Ahapua system were granted ownership of their parcels in an arrangement similar to mainland homesteading. But the government was expanding and many seats were now held by the growing Heoli, uh, or white non-native population. In 1850, a council established by American missionaries and businessmen passed the Alien Land Ownership Act, ensuring that the king's decree would allow for land purchase by settlers and foreigners. The colonizers brought, bought property or were gifted uh, it by chiefs and then leased it back to the government. Parcels were sold without regard to their interdependence within these larger ecosystems. By 1890, three quarters of private land in Hawaii was owned by foreign investors, predominantly Americans. In her book, Native Land and Foreign Desires, Lilikala Kamehelehe Kiba points out, legalistic private land tenure ran radically counter to the premises of the Ahapua, and the social adjustment was difficult. She writes, the native system had been ordered by a reciprocal obligation and understanding. In capitalist theory, private ownership of aina, or land, offered each individual great opportunities for private wealth if one understood the rules of capitalist society. But capitalist rules were not easily understood by or logical to Hawaiians. Most of the sea's property was planted with sugar and pineapple, which profoundly changed Hawaii's physical, political, and economic landscape. The tropical climate and well-drained, mineral-rich volcanic soil proved remarkably well-suited for sugarcane, and when production in Louisiana slowed during the Civil War, Hayolis in the Amer Hawaiian government threw support their support behind plantation agriculture. The Board of Immigration recruited workers primarily from China, Japan, Portugal, and the Philippines. Upland areas were deforested to build mills, and cane fields were competed with the taro fields for water. Unlike the slow and deliberate flows required in a lo'i, Sugarcane needs fast-moving irrigation, and flumes were installed across the landscape. Much of Hawaii's steep and densely forested uplands remains undeveloped to this day, but some Americans built estates there, including department store magnate Amos Cook, whose son Charles was part of a group of Americans who forced King David Kalakaua to sign the 1887 Bayonet Constitution, transferring power to a colonial uh, govern uh, governing body at literal gunpoint. When Kalakaua's sister, Queen Liliuokalani, ascended to the throne, she sought to draft a new constitution that would return some powers to the monarchy and extend citizens' voting rights. Two-thirds of the voting population supported this measure. But in 1893, another clique of merchants, led by Sanford B. Dole, organized an illegal takeover assisted by the U.S. military. Sanford Dole was installed as Hawaii's president. Two years later, Dole's regime quelled an uprising by Native Hawaiians, imprisoned the queen, charged her with treason, and sentenced her to a $5,000 fine and five years hard labor. By her own account, this was solely intended as a humiliation. The sentence was commuted uh, to a year of house arrest at Iolani Palace. To trace a line through three neighborhoods in the Waikiki Ahapua tells the story of how its fracture drove radical changes in the landscape, as well as inequitably divides power and resources. 
Precipitation that falls in Manoa, the highest point in the Waikiki Ahapua, is channelized by the time it flows down to Mo'ili'ili, either buried in culverts or shunted into neglected feeder canals running behind malls and apartment buildings. The Alawai Canal diverts this water to prevent flooding in Waikiki, where business now accounts for more than 40% of tourism rev revenue al and almost one-tenth of the state's gross domestic product. Waikiki's economy holds the state hostage, putting neighborhoods like Mo'ili'ili at an increased environmental risk. In Manoa, around the Cook Estate, streams still flow freely. The famous Manoa Falls are a short hike above the residential area and the mist is still constant. In Mo'ili'ili, in contrast, the landscape has been scraped and excavated repeatedly. A notable percentage of this flatland terrain actually sits on a vast karst of coral limestone that holds fresh water a geological anomaly that has long influenced life there. Oral histories describe pumps and pulley systems installed by Mo'ili'ili families to access the groundwater, and steps were cut uh, into coral caverns some 10 feet below the surface. One of my own students at University of Hawaii told me that her grandfather could dig a hole in his backyard and catch fish in the karst. In the mid 20th century, Mo'ili'ili was known as the floral capital of Honolulu, home to flower farms that also tapped into this groundwater. The centrality of these waters to neighborhood history is perhaps best exemplified in the famous Willows Restaurant, located on a Mo'ili'ili back street. The Willows was established in 1944 on the site of a homestead once owned by descendants of the Kamehameha dynasty to cater to military personnel stationed on Oahu. In the 1950s, the restaurant expanded with an open-air cocktail bar, um, and proprietors tapped into the karst to feed their koi pond. Uh, historian Laura Ruby in History of Mo'ili'ili said, from the rich and powerful to the average working family, everybody came uh, to the Willows, including myself. We used to hold our scholarship uh, luncheons at, at the Willows when I taught at University of Hawaii. Um, however, in 1998, a new owner replaced the karst-fed koi pond with a constructed lily pond. And in 2018, the restaurant closed for good. As in Waikiki, the vestiges of Hawaiian hydrology are gradually disappearing in Mo'ili'ili. The racial heterogeneity of contemporary Mo'ili'ili reflects not only the area's history, but the multifaceted politics of Asian immigration in Hawaii, a complex inheritance that helps to explain why struggles for equity and environmental justice involve more than a binary of settler colonialists versus native Hawaiians. Rather, as scholars like Candice Fujikani and uh, Dean Itsuji Saranio have argued, Full consideration of settler colonialism requires parsing the various forms of economic and political power held by ethnic groups in the state. Hawaii is often painted as a multicultural utopia. Uh, in fact, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, and Filipinos have been both subject to and complicit in systems of exploitation, assimilation, and resistance. Uh, scholars and activists such as Hanani K. Trask point to the fact that many Asians gained wealth and government positions when the territory became a state in 1959 which in turn perpetuated a narrative that only native Hawaiians failed to assimilate. Residents of Japanese heritage make up 40% of the legislature besides, uh, uh, despite being 20% of the population and have passed laws that further restrict Hawaiian independence and rights. On the other hand, Filipinos, Vietnamese, Marshallese and Micronesians and other Pacific Islanders tend to attain less education than Hawaiians with Pacific Islanders in particular experiencing a far higher rate of unemployment. Filipinos and Pacific Islanders have also uh, suffered disproportionate COVID-19 mortality rates in recent years. Mo'ili'ili sits in the shadow of contemporary Waikiki, which is defined by the twin forces of militarization and tourism that loom large across the state. The wetlands of Waikiki were occupied at the turn of the last century, mostly by Chinese rice and duck farmers. But in the 1920s, the area was dredged, the Alawai Canal was built, and the marshes drained into it, in the process mixing fresh and salt water, destroying reefs, and killing off freshwater rice fields and duck ponds, as well as the shoreline aquaculture fields. The wetlands supposedly threatened public health with mosquito-borne diseases like cholera and yellow fever, despite the fact that Hawaii had mostly dodged epidemics that had beset the mainland. These well-publicized health fears were also a pretense under which the military could occupy Waikiki and seize the land now known, known as Fort Derussi. The fort was built in 1908 on marshland dredged and filled to expand the beach for military exercises. The military is also largely responsible for ocean pollutants around Oahu, especially at Pearl Harbor, and for the beach erosion caused by concrete seawalls. 
The negative consequences of these bunker-like engineering projects are increasingly obvious as cl the climate crisis accelerates and have become a particularly, particularly acute in regard to the tenuous situation of the Alawai Canal. To describe this story in its broadest strokes, in the late 1980s, the city of Honolulu and the State's Department of Land and Natural Resources worked with community organizations to initiate an environmental assessment of the canal's notoriously terrible water quality and reached out to the United States Army Corps of Engineers for funding. Years of delay followed until at last in 2018, the USACE announced a new planning initiative, the Alawai Flood Risk Management Project. In its initial iteration, the project relied on plans for enormous dams and detention basins in upstream neighborhoods, as well as higher walls around the Alawai Canal. Residents of the watershed who live outside Waikiki, especially near the proposed basins, objected to a plan so clearly focused on protecting the tourist haven. Despite its pollution, the canal is used for canoeing and is flanked by a walking and cycling path that remains popular, and the proposed walls would cut off that recreational access. Costs for the plans were estimated at $345 million, with about a third to come from the state and the remainder to come from the federal government. An activist group called Protect Our Alawai Watershed harnessed resistance to the flood risk management project, specifically by uniting constituents across economic and topographic sectors of the watershed outside Waikiki, from the hillside neighborhoods of Palolo and Manoa to the less politically powerful Mo'ili'ili. In 2019, the group brought a successful suit to stop the sale of certificates of participation that would fund the project. Cindy Lynch, president of Protect Our Alawai Watershed, explains that the plan relied on decisions handed down from the distant reaches of the Army Corps of Engineer offices in Louisiana and Washington State, um, even going over the heads of the core project managers that were already installed in Hawaii. The result was an emphasis on flood control at lower elevations that ignored larger issues of habitat restoration across the watershed, including upkeep as simple as removing plant debris in the upstream detention basins and the flooding that would occur if the basins were clogged. Throughout this process, plans by the Army Corps of Engineers have been kept largely opaque to residents and even state and city governments, even as those plans continue to loom over and threaten to stymie local efforts. What is clear is that the Corps remains focused almost exclusively on the prevention of flooding in Waikiki. After recognizing shortcomings in their initial flood control models, the Army Corps of Engineers revised its plan in late 2020. The price tag for the new version, unveiled in January 2021, topped $651 million. Among other features, the revised plan ad added a four-story pump station at the Alawai Canal and eliminated the detention basins in Manoa in favor of culverts and bypass channels that would move water swiftly through the city. At not quite double the original projected cost, the revised price tag effectively stalled the project once again, and by the summer of 2021, Hawaii lost over $200 million of promised federal support. Honolulu's new mayor, Rick Blangiardi, uh, recently announced that the Army Corps of Engineers is now reevaluating the Alawai Flood Risk Management Project, but this time uh, in cooperation with community members. The primary purpose of the Ahapua system was to provide nourishment for the island's people. The colonial era conversion to export crops and the resulting eradication of breadfruit, taro, and other staple crops central to the Ahapua have done more than threaten food security. The plantation economy also decentered cultural stewardship practices that fostered these integrated modes of production. On the fringes, such practices persist though. Yet Hawaii now imports 90% of its food. A disruption on the mats and shipping line can immediately be felt in grocery stores. It is estimated that at any one time, Oahu has a three to 10 day supply of food. The Hawaii Department of Health estimates that while nearly 17% of the state's population is food insecure, among native Hawaiians, that number is 35.7%. Against the odds though, uh, the stewardship of water according to the Ahapua system remains central to the ways in which native Hawaiians and their allies seek to empower themselves and build community. The activism of the Protect Our Alawai uh, watershed is but one example. One of the group's co-founders, Sean Connolly, is an artist, architect, and scholar who for over a decade has explored the possibilities of the Ahapua model in the demilitarization of the islands and bringing restorative justice. He is currently mounting an online exhibition, the Alawai Centennial, to mark a century of the canal's harm to the landscape and imagines alternative futures via the recentering of traditional Hawaiian ecologies. At a different scale, others focus on the Ahapua as a model for food security. Dr. Jane Chung Doa, professor of public health at UH Manoa, uh, my former colleague, 
has worked for many years with the residents of Waimanalo, a largely native Hawaiian community on the eastern side of Oahu. Along with community leader Elima Hola Stimosa, she founded a program called MALAMA, which sound, stands for Mini Ahapua for Lifestyle and Mi'ae through aquaponics. Mi'ae means food, MALAMA means to take care of. Participants assemble in cohorts of 10 families each and learn to build low-cost aquaponics basins out of easily obtainab obtainable materials like plastic tubs and wooden tables. Adapting the Ahapua model to residential scale, they raise fish, vegetables, and medicinal plants in their backyards. And lastly, some see the restoration of the landscape as not just an ecological practice, but as a rectification of history. In what might seem like an unlikely partnership, Keolani Loom, a master cultural practitioner, a direct descendant of the chief stewards of the land she still lives on, and president of the Ali'i um, Ali Civic Club, um, has been working with the U.S. Navy to restore uh, Loco Pa'ayao, a six-acre pond on McGrew Point near Pearl Harbor that is estimated to have been built 400 years ago. Navy archaeologists found that almost, almost half the pond intact with a mortarless construction that could still filter the water, um, although invasive mangroves choked the site. With thousands of volunteer hours donated by civic clubs, schools, and the military, the pond has now been largely rehabilitated. Lokopa'ayao serves as a community education site and volunteers are constructing a hale um, or open air gathering structure. Service members with PTSD visit from the Tripler Army Medical Center for Therapy, and Keolani Loom's colleague Bruce, Bruce Keolani uh, guides the soldiers in offering huponopono, a Hawaiian prayer of reconciliation at the, at the hale. Such small but meaningful social reparations have occurred in concert with transformations in the fauna around the fish pond. When the mangroves were cleared, native plants came back. Navy divers examining the structure found large mullet that can now swim freely within it. And Loom has seen other changes. She told me, they've also found birds going clockwise over the Ku'ulau and ending up in sanctuaries on that side, right near Laie. So those are native species, endangered birds returning, and we have at least four or five of them. Different kinds that have returned as we built up the fish pond wall. The bigger flocks are returning, Kulea, Aku. So there's something happening. The ripple effects of this single pond's transformation have yet to be confirmed by quantitative measurement, but it's strongly worth considering other ways in which knowledge is produced, especially in indigenous cultures. Loom's recounting of the ecological shifts around local paeo is a talk story, a Hawaiian mode of social communication that can describe anything from a casual after work chat to ceremonial sharing of oral traditions. I'm reminded of my own talk story with Dr. Diane Paloma about the distinctions in Hawaiian language between mist in the air and on the ground that were verified by hydrological study. These are not random observations, but appraisals of phenomena that are grounded in years of generational wisdom and close relationships to the land. These insights are climate science too, and translating them into practice will require that scholars and policymakers create space for more of these conversations. Loom warned me that even moves toward a nature-based green infrastructures often consider only the physical requirements for sustainability and fail to address inequities between local constituencies, especially those whose lives, however urban, remain attuned to the nonlinear rhythms of wildlife, plants, and weather, and the knowledge of these cycles accumulated through generations. Such nominally green projects remain predicated on exerting power over land and water, rather than empowering the communities whose land and water are at stake. The ingenuity of the Ahapua system is unique to Hawaii, not simply in regard to the system's physical and logistical capacities, but in its deeply rooted connections to spirituality and sovereignty. So perhaps this integrative model um, can't truly be replicated anywhere else. It is also true, however, that all watersheds are natural systems synergized, as Ahapua are, through topography, resources, climate, and the sociocultural histories of use, each particular on its own terms and all intertwined. In their speculative proposal, The Commonwealth Approach, landscape architects Rob Holmes and Laurel McSherry show how the borders of the United States would appear if redrawn according to the management of rivers and aquifers, resulting in 86 different commonwealths. To move towards a watershed urbanism is to seek to build these commonwealths both in and beyond cities, and in so doing, repair a built environment that treats water as a material to be mastered rather than an elemental force of abundance and a fundament fundamental vector of survival 
and hence of human rights. Watersheds connect people across race and economic lines and thus present opportunities for organizing collective power. Caring holistically for watersheds requires specific place-based approaches and deep landscape knowledge. None of this can happen under the crushing forces of colonialism, which persists through the material realities of infrastructural imposition and the hoarding of power. Watershed urbanism thus asks us to reconfigure the false binary of city versus nature and to understand how ecology can truly serve all those who live in densely built locations, especially the most vulnerable. To decolonize is to reckon with colonialist history and its present day effects, to acknowledge that these effects remain part of our landscapes, both literally and, and psychically, and to uh, begin the processes of deconstruction. Decolonization can sound like an abstraction, but the Ahavua is a social, technical, hydrological reality and is a model for practical sustainability and projects as small as a tabletop garden and as large as the rethinking of entire watersheds. Each iteration is its own form of resistance. As histories of colonial occupation continue to crack open, more opportunities arise for the reclamation of indigenous lands, cultures, and sovereignties. Not only in Honolulu, but in other cities and regions confronting the acute effects of the climate crisis, which is to say, all of us. To borrow a metaphor from political scientist Noe Noe Silva, it is when we start to re-examine history that resistance, like water, rushes in and alters the forms that seek to contain it. Mahalo. Don't let that deter you. Yes. There. Um, so the, um, the question was, are there other organizations that are trying to make a land banking system? Oh, economists and financial experts. Um, so there is actually on the east side of Oahu, um, the He'ea Ahapua, which is almost a completely restored Ahapua, which has been done by various forms of land banking. I'm not sure if it has been um, looked over by economists, but it was sort of a, a ground up uh, way to um, bank land and pr uh, provide partnerships, right, and kind of knit together the ownership uh, again. Um, I'm not aware of specifically sort of financial structures that, that allow for this uh, re-knitting together. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think we, uh, you know, all, all of us settlers occupy stolen land, right? So th I think the first step is recognizing those histories. And I think, you know, realizing that indigenous science is not, you know, when you research a project, right, you go to the library, you look at the paper, but are there other ways that you can gather knowledge, whether it's by talking to 
uh, local tribes and, um, and recognizing these land management techniques. The other reason is, you know, I'm, I'm an architect and landscape architect, and what I, I tried to show through this writing and what I discovered for myself is that, yeah, decolonialization sounds huge and it sounds abstract, but you can see it in so many ways in just where are highways planned, right? How is the water managed? Where is it diverted to? Where is it buried? Like, those are very material realities that come from colonialization. And so dismantling the, you know, just a channel, right, or opening up the channel, thinking about care, thinking about long-term stewardship, that's the beginning to doing it. We often sort of like disconnect the infrastructure that we experience from the colonial history. But if we recognize that in front of us is, is colonial as well, then that gives us a starting point, I think, to, to, um, to deconstruct and, and restore, right? And so that's what I hope to inspire here is like, you know, these ideas, planning ideas, tabletop garden to bring food security, right? So that's an ingenious invention. So it's just building a fish pond. These can have real reverberations and not just because it's a physical place, but it's a place to build community through the making of it and through the care of it as well. Oh, <laughs> uh, but recently Great. I've actually become very obsessed with what you've been talking about, uh, the fact that like, water and also land are, are wealth that has been taken away from many groups. Um, so we've been talking about introducing really advanced greenhouse technology and water retention while mm -hmm. using uh, native knowledge to bring industry to Native American reservations, which traditionally had nothing yeah. because we had taken it all. Right. new values to these communities that have had all of their values stripped away from them? Um, well, first of all, I, I would say um, they do have assets, right? And they do have value. So start with that sort of, like, like start with the recogni recognizance of the assets that they, they, they do bring. And maybe that was other. Um, I think a, a lot of narratives of indigenous peoples start with taking away, which is important to recognize, right? But how do we build up the assets that, that they already have? That's an important, that's just as an important place to, to start, I think. And then, you know, how, um, how are indigenous tribes folded back into policy making, right? Landscape architecture, education, <laughs> right? Can we reclaim it that way as well? And so I think it's more about, um, uh, I, th I, I think it's, it's more about uh, starting, starting with, that, with that value instead of, you know, a, a plot of land. But it's, it's a wonderful project. It's very cool. And I'd, I'm, I'd be fascinated to, to know what you learn from, from them as well, as well as giving them these, these resources back. So. Sure. Um, you have um, written this article um, that's associated with this talk um, for Places Journal, mm -hmm. um, which, as I noted earlier, is um, a journal that features public scholarship around the built environment. And I'm wondering if you, um, knowing that you frequently publish um, in scholarly journals, if you could tell us a little bit about that experience mm -hmm. of, of writing for uh, Places Journal, which, by the way, has no paywall, so you, you all can look at it anytime you want, and it's full of everything about the built environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, it was just, it was such a, I've been wanting to write for Places Journal for the longest time, so this is just an incredible opportunity to write a piece of public scholarship um, that was openly accessible. I am grateful to be in a field like architecture and landscape architecture that values public scholarship also when it comes to tenure um, and to communicating how these ideas um, affect all of us. And I think, you know, it's what I love about places is that they recognize that architecture, design, uh, urban planning, landscape architecture is not a silo. Everybody has feelings on the built environment. We all occupy the built environment. We all have thoughts about it, right? And the ethos of Places Journal to make that scholarship accessible for, for everybody um, is just um, is, is incredible. Like, I'm, I've, they've done so much, I think, for the field. 
um, on that end, um, I had to radically rethink how I write. Like those of you that are used to reading <laughs> academic writing, right? It, it, it fits a certain template. And I wanted to take this as an opportunity to interview people, to, to talk to them. Uh, of course, I wanted to go back to Hawaii to photograph places and maybe do mapping uh, myself, and, and that didn't happen. And so I think it also, um, while being much more rigorously edited uh, through the process of doing this, it was interesting to try and kind of like dabble in more journalistic practices as well, to be contemporary, um, and to uh, form an argument that had to be much more succinct, right, and, and readable to a public audience. But I try and do that in, in most of my work. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I think it's so important because I want people to be excited and I want people to be involved and I want them to be to understand again how like you know how these structures are colonial I want them to understand how the built environment affects their health their choices um, because everybody does experience it and we should all have a part in uh, in reshaping it as well Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've tried to highlight some of them here. I think, you know, it's very the kind of the relationship between the Army Corps of Engineers, which is like very um, top down and I think very much opaque to a lot of the people that have lived there. They even stymie people in local government. Like I, I talked to somebody in the mayor's office of climate change and even they are trying to rethink water management practices, like starting with a very... Um, starting at the very basic level of, of adopting a one water policy, which I was told, you know, like water that hits the ground, water that is underground, and water in open water bodies are all managed by separate departments right now, <laughs> right? So one water policy, which is a policy template cities like Milwaukee, Los Angeles, and San Francisco are adopting right now, actually tries to realign those departments. And so, I, so, I mean, I, th I think there are, um, you know, Honolulu is, for all of these impositions, their actual government, right, is actually quite progressive in thinking about climate change and trying to integrate these indigenous knowledge practices. And so what I've tried to highlight here is, you know, sort of an undoing, I, I think, of these years and years of infrastructure that's been imposed without, you know, without the regard to community members. But a, a lot of things that are happening now are this form of resistance to break it down. Oh, yeah, so sorry, I might have used a wrong term, but I think what it was is there's a, there's a really complex series of land agreements, I would say. They've owned, like 20 different owners that they've, they've had to like figure out the agreements between um, in order to restore land, right, that was previously part of one ecosystem. So I'm sorry, so the land bank is more of, maybe land trust is, uh, is a better word for it, where it's technically still owned by private entities, but they've had to knit it back together in order to have a, a consistent ahapua. Yeah. Well, I think this is the time we should probably wrap things up, but um, I would like to say thank you once again to Dara. Really wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you to maybe the 10 people